Hello, hello! Welcome to episode 40 oh, God, of an ongoing series where we basically take the camera anywhere we want and we try to find secrets and new discoveries to some of our favorite games. So for all you skeptics out there who think that a 2D episode can't work, have faith and let me know what you think at the end of the episode. Alright, let's get going. First, I want to thank A Plus Start. Yes, son of a glitch himself for making the intro this week. It looked amazing, dude. But to get back on topic, I think a lot of you are probably going to be asking yourselves right now, how are you going to do a lot of the things that you do in Boundary Break? Well, let me dispel a little bit of that right now by showing you one of this show's most treasured features, a zoom out. So when you zoom out on net, you can actually see that the entire area is connected. Even areas you can't reach as a player was still made by the game's art team so that the geography in the town of Onet and many other places in Earthbound would be accurate and would make sense even if you could go to those areas. Now while we can't zoom the camera in on pixels, Super Nintendo games have layers. And the way that this becomes a treasure trove for our boundary break is that you can hide things behind layers. Like for example, at the very start of the game of Earthbound, you can see that the house has curtains. And if we remove the sprite layer, you'll see that the curtains disappear. Now some of you might be asking, why bother making curtains at all? Well, there's a reason for that. Earthbound's technology allows you to change the lighting and colors of any environment at any given time. However, you can only do this to the entire environment. And when the lights turn on in Ness's house, <laughs> The daylight also turns on. So to cover up the daylight when they turn the lights on in the house, they put curtains over all the windows. So now that you know how this episode works, let's start finding Stief. Over here at the crater site with the meteor, we can actually discover that there is a crater unique to the meteor itself hiding underneath. But you never get a chance to see it because the meteor never leaves the game. And also if we walk over here, we can see that these moving clouds are not just on the sprite layer. They actually move around as character models. And the reason why we know this is because the only thing that Ness can't walk through right now is NPCs and enemies. So in order for this to be stopping him in his tracks, it essentially has to be a dummy NPC. Before we move on from Onet, I wanted to show a normal view of Ness walking through some of the areas that you have no access to, just to help sink into you, the viewer, the reality here that all these areas are actually connected to each other. Cliff sides, a thicket of woods, and even terrain itself is well off camera, but was made with a specific purpose, and that is so that it can take up an entire block that it needs to take up in order to be Onet, which I'll explain more about in a bit. So much like a handful of other NPCs that we're going to be taking a look at in this episode, the manager of the Chaos Theater is always hidden behind something, which is his desk in this case. So if we remove the layer that hides sprites, we can finally take a look at what the manager looks like in full. Now while he doesn't have a sprite for looking backwards for some reason, he does have one for looking forwards into the side. Another cool thing with layers is that some of the backgrounds, not all, in the battle scenes of Earthbound, you can oftentimes see two layers being used to represent the background. Of course, if we remove one layer, you can see how the other one would look before the two were combined together. Now here's a rather stupendous little tidbit. In a few cases, but it's very rare, some towns in Earthbound will actually be connected to each other, and then the environments cross over seamlessly. Like for example, we just started at Tucson and worked our way down into Happy Happy Village. Now the only problem with this is that Happy Happy Village is supposed to have blue colors, and that's triggered when you load the map again when you're in Happy Happy Village. But since we didn't go through any cave entrances, the colors from Tucson carry over. So listen, I don't blame you if this next segment goes right over your head. I feel like I'm kind of being like a teacher right now, which is weird. But let me try to break down what's going on here. So in this room, there are a bunch of cultists. Now, there are some that you can talk to and some that don't speak to you at all. And when we start removing layers in this game, you can see that the real NPCs that you can actually talk to disappear because they're sprites. They're just like you. However, the other guys are just scenery. They're props. So they're only there to block your way. So they're not sprites. Instead, there's some parts environment and other parts overlapping layer. So if you walk behind these guys, Ness will be obscured by their hoods. And of course, if we start removing layers, you can see just that part of the cultist that's supposed to cover Ness. All right, let's relax our brains a little bit. This is supposed to be an entertainment show. So let's take a look at the Runaway 5 stage. One of the most glorious things about it is that you can actually see that your characters can go behind the curtain and under the sign. Now seeing as the Runaway 5 goes behind the curtain, this is not really a surprise to anybody, but the sign is something that none of the characters ever went under at any given time. So to see that it has a top layer is pretty momentous. 
Now here's an unusual trick used for Tessie. As you know, Tessie rises from the water so that Jeff can ride on her or it or him, I don't know. But if we remove the base layer of the game, you can see that there's a blue watercolored layer. Now what's really odd about this in particular is that it only exists for as long as Tessie rises from the water. It's meant to hide it, but I can't remove that layer without removing Tessie because it's on the sprite layer. Nowhere else in Earthbound can I recall that there is a layer that's on the sprite sheet that's meant to mask any of the characters. Usually it's on a layer all on its own. <laughs> Alright, you guys ready to check out Saturn Valley? I know I am. I've been waiting for this all my life. So first up is this Mr. Saturn inside of a trash can, and you would think that this would be all one sprite model, but believe it or not, that trash can is not a sprite whatsoever. In fact, it belongs to the base layer. So if we remove the Mr. Saturn, you can actually see the inside of the trash can, which is odd because this trash can only belongs to the Mr. Saturn. And now we are inside the drugstore equivalent of Saturn Valley. Fun little fact, if we remove the sprite layer in this room, you can actually see that there's a cup underneath the phone. Now this can mean one of two things. Either one, it wasn't originally meant to be a telephone there, and that you were actually meant to drink the coffee here inside the shop, or the more likely reason, the art designers of this game decided not to make an empty plate because they knew they could put a phone right on top of the existing cup plate model. Now this isn't very boundary breaky, but this is my first time discovering it now as a hardcore Earthbound fan, so I figured I'd share it with you guys. Apparently, if you go back to the Red House in Happy Happy Village after you rescue the Saturns, you're actually allowed inside the house. And inside you can find a Mr. Saturn, of course, with a unique elongated room. So one question I've always wanted to know is just how long the traffic actually is that blocks you off and forces you to go off into the desert in order to reach Foreside. Well, it's, uh, I should have been prepared for this, I, but I'm pretty disappointed either way. The traffic pretty much stops almost immediately after you get to the part of the screen that you're not allowed to see. Now it's time to be a little bit surprised. Did you know that the tunnel that you are supposed to go into, travel through, and then come out on the other side to get to the Foresight Bridge, actually has a full tunnel that you can walk over and still get to that bridge? It almost seems like making that tunnel for you to walk through is kind of pointless. Alrighty do. I think we gotta do a zoom out for one of the most iconic areas from Earthbound. Foresight. Now when you zoom out Foresight, you can actually see that it's not quite as big and city-like as it seemed itself to be. There's actually very few roads to explore. But because the buildings are so massive compared to anything else in the game, I think we were all awestruck when we first reached this area. I also figured that we could take a look at these buildings, because while it is pretty nice to see the entire city in one shot, you can also appreciate seeing these giant buildings in one screen as well. Now here's something I thought that I found for the very first time. I was so excited. And of course, somehow, someway, someone already found it and put it on the Cutting Room Floors website. But it's still cool and I still wanna share it with you guys. So I've been playing Earthbound out of sequence a lot. And one of the things that I found out was that this clumsy robot over here at one point was supposed to be able to be defeated before you help out the Runaway 5. Now, in the final build of the game, that's simply not possible. You cannot beat this robot before helping the Runaway 5, and what happens at the end of that battle is that the Runaway 5 comes into the room, flips the switch to off, and you're essentially rescued. But if we do it out of sequence and we fight this robot, things play out a lot differently. Ladies and gentlemen, meet Jackie. Jackie owns Jackie's Cafe, which at one point was Jackie's Bar. And talking to Jackie is really restrictive. However, if we move anywhere we want in the game, we can talk to him from different angles. And if we talk to him from the side, he puts away his martini. And if we talk to him from behind, he doesn't turn around all the way, he just kind of tilts his head as if to say, yeah, I see you back there. So similar to the Chaos Theater owner, we're going to remove a layer so that we can see the spooky mook in all of his glory. So after you capture all the zombies, they're locked away in this animal cage, and you're still able to talk to one or two of them. But there's one zombie that's tucked all the way in the back, and no matter what angle you get at the cage, you're not able to talk to him. However, if we boundary break through the animal cage, we can see what he actually was going to say. Now, it's not any new dialogue from when they were stuck to the ground, but it is interesting that they left some dialogue attached to this zombie. Now, as you know, in summers, the buildings start to get so dense that you can't move any further. And I think a lot of us want to know what's beyond that point. Well, unfortunately, this design was very deliberate, and so if you try to go any further than you're allowed to go, you'll start to see the boundaries. 
Now in the faraway kingdom of Dalam, we speak to Pooh's master, and with the ability to move wherever we want, we can see the back of his head. Again, something that's just never shown in game. Here's another weird sequence dialogue that I found while playing the game. If you pick up the carrot key that goes to Delam, but you don't go to the sanctuary to use the key, there's this little extra nugget of dialogue from the sailor who brings you to Scaraba. I also never visited home or called my mom during my playthrough of the game. So he mentions something about how I don't miss home, and then he starts to mention the carrot key. Which again, it's just, it's, I don't get it. <laughs> Why is that in the game? You know, speaking of this scene, this is an awfully unique area of the game, so I figured we could go visit it. Now, while you can kind of see pretty much everything there is to see a skewed off screen, if you move all the way to the edge of the map, you can see the buildings and volcanoes in full. And what's really interesting too is that the land in this area can be walked on, which makes me wonder at one point if you were supposed to have the mini sprites and walk around through here. Speaking of areas we're not supposed to be, check this out. Inside the deepest part of Magisant, there's a unique sound effect for when you're walking on the green part. In this quick little segment, I'm gonna debunk some stuff. Now, in certain areas of the game, like where the chief is talking to a police officer behind the barriers, among many other areas where you can see an NPC, but you just can't quite reach them, you wanna go over there and talk to them and see what they're gonna say. Well, don't worry, I considered all of those areas. And this little clip is just meant to be a small example of what happens when you do try to talk to them. Okay, time to peel back the curtain just a little bit. In the world of Earthbound, everything exists on one giant plane. Now here's the only problem though. When you go in and out of areas, it loads a new texture. So if you were to immediately walk to an adjacent area, you're not gonna see it. It's going to look like the void, but it's not actually. And the best indication of that is what music plays when you step into the darkness. But don't worry, all's not lost. If you wanna see the area that you stepped into, all you gotta do is use the soundstone because it behaves the same way as loading a zone. So for example, the Lost Underworld is directly above Foreside, and if we use the soundstone here, we can be big character models inside the Lost Underworld, which is awesome. Which also made me think of something. What if we came from the Underworld as tiny sprites and worked our way back down to Foreside? What would happen then? And the results were exactly what I hoped they would be. Introducing tiny sprites in Foreside, I do recall on Starman.net that there's unused sprites for Nest doing the fuzzy pickles. So what if we took the tiny sprites over to a photo spot in Foreside? What would happen then? <laughs> oh yeah, of course. I should have figured. So now we're going to take a look at Gygus. There is one thing about Gygus that the player is not allowed to see that we're going to show you today. And that is that the full picture of Gygus is not in frame and you're not allowed to see it in full frame. But if we move the camera up just a little bit more, it looks like Gygus almost has like a rib cage or like a hatch door at the very tip of his uh, whatever he is. To me, this is especially important because Gygus in general is wrapped in so much mystery. You want to know as much about him as you can. So to see this little extra bit of his entire embodiment is something special. So now we're going to finish this episode by incorporating all the things we learned today, which is that the entire world of Earthbound is connected together, that when you walk past a boundary, you're actually walking into another area of the game without loaded textures. And thirdly, if we don't properly load the map with the correct color settings, it'll incorporate the color settings from another area so long as they have the same sprites. So once we get to the end of our little journey here, we actually stumble upon the flashback sequence that Ness sees in Magisant where he visits his home for the first time and sees himself as a baby. Now normally this scene is in black and white, but because we traveled here from Onet during nighttime, it's got a nighttime setting instead. And I did take a look. Unfortunately, we can't walk inside the house, but you know where it leads to. All right guys, we finally did it. It's my favorite game of all time in a boundary break episode somehow. Woo! Oh. <laughs> right? All right, so I just want to thank A Plus Start for doing this week's intro. Hey, no problem. Andy? A Plus Start? Dude, dude, the intro is freaking amazing. Thank you so much for doing it. We should we should collaborate sometime. I'm sorry I was pulling a roast out of the oven. Did you say something? Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. I, thought, I was just saying we should collaborate sometime. What do you think? Sure, maybe in a few weeks. 
All right, cool. So <laughs> look forward to that, I think. <laughs> Anyways, guys, uh, I'm going to be on vacation, so I'm not going to be able to do a vote for this week. Instead, I'm going to do a remaster of a really old episode, and that episode is going to be The Legend of Zelda, The Wind Waker, which Pat might remember shooting for. I think I remember that one. More footage, better commentary, better pacing. You're going to get it all. So I hope that you enjoy it. And uh, I kind of sounded like Reggie fils for like a second there. <laughs> With a world of possibilities, my body is ready. <laughs> but will it be 1080p or 4K? We don't care about graphics with Nintendo. <laughs> Expect 720p. <laughs> if you like this episode, consider checking out the playlist. Uh, the playlist will have a whole mess of games that you may want to suggest, but it may be there already. So if you want to check it out and see if it's an episode that you are interested in, uh, please click right here and you can see all the episodes I've done in the past. So with that said, guys, I want to take care. And I want to thank you so much for watching this week's episode. I hope you enjoyed it. Let me know if you did. Take care. Adios.